that so quickly after the end of World War II, this was a massive problem in the US because, mm -hmm. you know, we see that as a period where, you know, the UK, the UK and the Allies and the Americans all, you know, bond banded together to fight exactly this, mm -hmm. you know, sort of militarized anti-Semitism, if you like. And that two years later, it's it's like a, an epidemic uh, yeah. at home. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the show. My name is James, joined as ever by my good friend Steve. And this is Every Best Picture, where we go through every winner of the Academy Award for Best Picture from Wings right up till the present day. This episode, we are talking 1947's Gentlemen's Agreement. Hey, but before we look at Gentlemen's Agreement, if you haven't already subscribed, it'd be a great favor to us if you did so. James, yes, it would. Yes. <laughs> James, uh, what do right. we have to say about uh, Gentleman's Agreement? Uh, this okay. was the first viewing for myself. I'd never seen it before, unlike some of our other Every Best Pictures. Uh, I went into this pretty blind. I, I thought Gentleman's Agreement was going to be some kind of love romance between mm. Gregory Peck. And obviously there is romance in it, but uh, the theme of the film is completely different than what I was imagining. Yes, the romance here is between Gregory Peck and the Jewish people, you could say. Yes. But uh, yeah, no, I didn't know this movie at all. It was one of those blind spots on the list of Best Picture winners um, that I'd never seen. And yeah, had no idea what it was about. Didn't even realize Elia Kazan directed it. You know, um, Me neither. I, I, that When it when it's came up directed by Elia Kazan, I went, oh, wow, I, on the waterfront guy. Well, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. You know, he would go on to win Best Director. Uh not ten, not ten years from from now, uh, for that film. Um, so yeah, so I came in completely cold, and it seems that it actually it's a fairly timely time to be talking about this movie. Yes, I mean essentially the premise is that um, Gregory Puck plays a journalist who um, masquerades as a Jewish man, goes undercover to expose anti-Semitism in New York City. Uh, after world war ii and discovers there's a lot of it pretty much yeah. everywhere and even people who don't consider themselves who aren't actively being uh mm -hmm. anti-semitic have you know deeply ingrained prejudices that they can't even get uh, you know uh, dodge even if they wanted to and i think that is almost the bigger message is mm -hmm. that sure there are always going to be sort of nazi type anti-semites out there but they're, they're easy to spot and easy to contain and control in a way. Mm -hmm. It's the fact that it has become sort of, uh, you know, subliminal second nature to so many people just in modern day society. That's where the real problem is. It's just recognizing your prejudice, owning mm -hmm. your prejudice and doing something about it. Yeah, this this movie could almost be seen as a surface level uh, take at, you know, anti-Semitism or, you know, racism or discrimination in general. Mm -hmm. But I actually found as the movie progressed, it really put its finger on issues that we're dealing with in 2024. When Gregory Peck and Dorothy McGuire have that encounter at the end, it's very, it gets very um, passionate where McGuire is insisting she's not being racist. She's not being anti-Semitic. And, Gregory Peck is telling her, yes, essentially you are. You don't even know that you are. Mm -hmm. And th this is definitely themes that 75 years later, we are still wrestling with um, in in today's today's world. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, one of the scenes that sticks with me is when little Tommy uh, comes home from school. You know, Gregory Peck's mm -hmm. son comes home from school and says, oh, he's been bullied by the kids. They're calling me this. They're calling me that. And she grabs him and says, oh, Tommy, don't don't forget, we're just pretending you're not Jewish. You're as much a Gentile as I am. And Gregory Peck explodes. He's like, that's not the point. Yes. The point yeah. is not that that you are not Jewish. The point is that is that they are prejudiced against Jews. And, yeah. you know, yeah. And, and therein lies the problem, not not trying to excuse it by by yeah. saying, oh, it's you know, they are mistaken. We're not we're not one of them. Yes. It's the yeah. fact that you're saying one of them. Yeah. The interesting, I grew up in a, you know, German Lutheran community outside of Detroit. And so for me, the anti-Semitism or any kind of discrimination against Jewish people was just, that wasn't even a thought in our community. Mm. The real, the racism I experienced growing up in a white community was against black Americans. There was a lot of uh, you know, black Americans in Detroit, probably secondary was the Poles, the Polish, we, you know, everybody told a Polish joke. There was no Jewish jokes. There was black jokes, Polish jokes, 
uh, Middle Eastern jokes, basically the the racial communities outside the white communities in Detroit. That's what I remember as being the racial, you know, uh, discrimination I can look back on growing up. Anti-Semitism just didn't even figure in. And I don't know if it is from my evangelical Christian background, where we always kind of deferred a bit to Israel and the Jewish people. And so I I, I can honestly say, I don't remember any anti-Semitism mm. in my childhood growing up. So watching Gentleman's Agreement, I was like, really, this, this happens, this goes on, but I, I'm really blind to it. Yeah, I mean, similarly, well, kind of similarly in a way, I mean, it wasn't very prominent. I grew up in a you know fairly fairly sort of sheltered white uh, middle class environment as well. You know, mm-hmm. at a boarding school where most of the stu- students there were it's a white middle class like, kids. Yeah. And you know, if I have to put my hand on my heart, you know, one of our good friends was a was a Jewish kid, and mm-hmm. his nickname was was a bit of a of an epithet that I'm ashamed to yeah. even repeat now. Yeah. But it was but it was uh, was speaking for myself and from how people used it around it there was no malicious intent it was just that was that was just his nickname that's just what what we called yeah. it and yeah. and and he was very much very much a, a good friend and a very popular kid and all the rest of it um that just you know that just was his nickname sadly yeah. and it yeah. was you know it's, it's nothing to be proud of at all now oh, i but... i remember gym teachers when i was a kid calling kids by racial epithets in class and they weren't wow. even making it malicious and granted i didn't hear the n-word but no, no, but no. like towards italians you know there would be there would be racial uh and and the the thing is i mean now it's just horrific but it wasn't even meant with any intention of maliciousness it was almost you know, as much as I, I'd hate to defend the indefensible, mm. it was that uh, the PE teachers would actually be trying to be endearing, you know, uh, in, in yeah. some way. And obviously, we're at a different age now. But um, it, it's interesting how a movie bringing it back to gentlemen's agreement, how, you know, doing a little reading on the, the film, there was a lot of people in the Jewish community that didn't want it made because they didn't want to raise this issue. They didn't want to stir up trouble. And I'm realizing unless you're kind of willing to deal with certain things, we keep using these epitaphs in ignorance or we we do racial things in ignorance, like the Dorothy McGuire character. I know, as you you mentioned about the young Jewish boy who, you know, there was an epitaph. I remember using language in the 70s and 80s that I'm ashamed of now. Right. And it, I wasn't trying to be malicious. And often my my friends, it's just it was a different world. The thought processes were different. And, and I think movies like gentlemen's agreement and great storytelling in general helps us kind of ele- elevate the, the issues and the dialogue. So we can kind of, I don't know, move humanity forward a little bit. Definitely. I mean, that seems to be very much part of the story. I mean, I was surprised that it was um, adapted from a novel that was published the same year. So yeah. it was, it was very much, you know, the hot topic of the moment it seems mm-hmm. it's interesting there was another film that's mentioned that was came out around the same time called crossfire which mm-hmm. dealt with the same thing but actually the book it was based on was a sort of anti-homosexuality narrative and they changed that for right. for the uh for the film and i don't think it was like oh we can't talk about anti-homosexuality more than this is this is not the hot button issue of the moment you know right. what what it is what is the topic is, is anti-semitism uh so it was and it's it's amazing to me as someone who was born in the 70s, um, that so quickly after the end of World War II, this was a massive problem in the US because, mm-hmm. you know, we see that as a period where, you know, the UK the UK and the Allies and the Americans all, you know, bond- banded together to fight exactly this, mm-hmm. you know, sort of militarized anti-Semitism, if you like. And that two years later, it's, it's like a, an epidemic uh, yeah. at home. Yeah. And and yeah. arguably was was always there and was there before the war and mm-hmm. uh, you know it was just put to one side for mm-hmm. the for the greater good if you like during World yeah. War Two, but was was always there very much and very much on the rise. I mean, you look at um, sort of a book like the going slightly off topic, but the Adventures of Cavalier and Clay, uh, which talked mm-hmm. about sort of the 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 Jewish kids who. It's a kind of fictionalized version of essentially the 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 two young Jewish guys who invented Superman in oh, New York right. in the yeah. 90s, yeah. third 1930s. Yeah. Um, 
and it's it's a fictional version of that but they were they were immigrants who came over you know from from eastern europe and they had to encounter sort of all of this mm-hmm. sort of prejudice and yeah. bigotry within new york city and within the publishing uh, industry before the war and then the war kind of distracted everybody for a bit yeah. but then immediately and then you, but then you watch something like band of brothers and even there you know it's it's done with slightly more camaraderie often yes right you know like what you were talking about how how it would be done at school but um there you know they're all having a go at each other for every for everything yeah, yeah. you know and so it was in a way the war was this sort of great unifier yeah. uh but then was just as quickly forgotten it seems that two years after the fact uh everybody's everybody's back to being <laughs> indulging their yeah. prejudices should we say well you know uh two thoughts come to mind that, that i've been stewing on right there when you said uh, uh about band of brothers bringing people together even amongst the racial epitaphs uh reading anthony bourdain's uh, kitchen confidential he mentions and it made me think that a a kitchen a professional kitchen is not unlike a war zone Mm -hmm. and he says don't even bother getting into the culinary arts if you are sensitive about any kind of racial epitaphs because you hear them in it's a rite of passage in a in a professional kitchen. Now, he wrote that book a few years ago. Maybe times have changed. I don't know. The other point I wanted to raise is what was interesting is this movie came out in 1948. And this is just when Israel, the nation, is being formed. And yet mm. there was no discussion. I'm wondering what if the movie Crossfire and this film are also the result of there would have been a lot of news and a lot of attention about the new state of Israel, or at least it's an impending statehood. So I'm I'm just curious. I have not read or seen anything, and there's no reference made in the movie to Israel. But I can't help but feel that that loomed in the background while this film was being made. Yeah, I wonder whether it kind of just predated it enough that um that it, that it wasn't a talking point, or or that it might have det- detracted from the core message of the movie, which was this is happening right on our doorstep. And right. right among us, you know, this isn't something that's happening in another mm-hmm. country across the Atlantic. This mm-hmm. is something that's happening right here, right now. And mm-hmm. I think that they make it gets that point across very effectively. Um, I do, I do think I kind of have to sort of confess. I think it's a, it's a more one of those movies that's kind of like more important than it is good necessarily. I mm-hmm. think it's a movie where you know the the message and the subject matter, as as often happens in kind of historical movies, yeah. and you, you run. I think that you run into danger defending a movie because you agree with its with its historical or political point right you know? and yeah. it's like those two are, those two things and you can you can have a very good movie about a bad thing or you can have a very bad yeah. movie about a about a good thing and i think this isn't a very bad movie but i think it's kind of it's a perfectly fine movie yeah, yeah. it's an it's an okay movie but it's obviously about something very good and very important i think this movie is largely carried by gregory peck who mm. apparently was the go-to guy for fighting discrimination between this and to kill a mockingbird you <laughs> oh, know sure. well, it certainly and, became his thing yeah yeah and and i was just reminded how much gravitas gregory peck brings to a role because i think you nailed it this film's themes are more noble than the actual film itself in fact if anything i thought it took way too long to get into the nuts and bolts of the film. It's like he spends the first 30 minutes trying to find his angle. Mm. And I found that I found that a little bit boring. Like, come on, just figure it out. Once he finally assumed the 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 persona of a Jewish writer, a Jewish man, then it was starting to pick up a little steam. But I thought the pacing in this film, especially at the beginning, was was not very strong. Yeah, no, I, I agree. The first half an hour or so I was because I was because I hadn't seen it before, I was still like, okay, where's where's this going? Where's it going, really? yeah, really. You know what what is happening here? Uh, and then you know, as it as it picks up, sure, it, it gets interesting. But I think even then, quite quickly, it gets dare I say a little repetitive. Where it's yeah, like, yeah. I expose it here, I expose it here, I expose it yeah. here. You know, I get the point they're making is it's everywhere and nowhere is you know immune or or a safe haven or what have you. But it does end up being a little bit of a kind of checklist of just like boom, 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 boom. And yeah. I got to admit, I'm a little dissatisfied with which of the women he ends up with. Um, I, I mean, I, guess... I wish they had. I wish they'd made it more nebulous, and you didn't know which one he was going to end up with because. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't like the fact that he seemed like he was going to go back to Dorothy McGuire. I kind of like that that 
that relationship ended. And I don't know what the reasoning was. Well, like, maybe it's a 1948 sensibility at the time. I don't know. I guess I guess the reason is they want to give a um an optimistic spin on it. They were like, just you know, you gotta recognize that that in all of us may lurk these uh you know un, un, unnoticed prejudices mm -hmm. and we need to recognize them address them and forgive you know don't yes. demonize don't demonize somebody for, for for being raised a certain way to think a certain way what have you you know point them out address them do your best to get past them and then and then move move ahead and so i guess that's the message here is that once she she addressed the issue she recognized that oh no i am anti-semitic or at least i have these ingrained prejudices you know by the end when she lets let's uh don is it the, the dave goldman yeah. you know and his family move into the house in that neighborhood and she's even going to go and live there as well just to sort mm -hmm. of protect him if you like you're like okay fine you know she's taking yeah. the necessary steps to better herself and uh, make things better for the jewish community so yeah. all is forgiven but i mean i thought celeste holmes character was so much more fun such yes. a such a yes. more yes. Sort of yeah. attractive and interesting character that... which is why she won the academy award right right and and she's clearly all into Gregory Peck's character. I yeah. was just kind of like, oh, come on, you know, yeah. She, yeah. that'd be a lot more fun. <laughs> yeah, when she kind of opens up, finally opens up the end and says, you know, yeah, she was a racist all along. Just, you know, just just come with me, baby. And I thought, oh, this is a great way to end it. I thought, oh, this would be good. And of course, yeah. Dorothy McGuire. And, you know, I, I kind of concur with what you you said, because this, this film obviously is trying to uh, send a message. And if someone who is wrestling with racial prejudices if we can still reconcile in the end then there's hope for america type there's there's right. that kind of that theme which i get um i mean if he I, had I shacked do... up i guess if he had shacked up with celeste home then it's almost like you know drawing a line in the sand and yeah, going, you're either yeah. on this side or the, or the, or the other side and you're either a little, with us or against us it's a little know? combative i think <laughs> well and it also doesn't acknowledge you know i remember during the height of the the, the trump situation um, I was talking to somebody very close with me and this person was insisting, Steve, I'm not a racist. I'm not a racist. And to me, anytime someone has to kind of vocally say that mm -hmm. it's with such passion, there's usually something lurking in the background. And I just came right back and I said, well, I am. And this person just looked at me and they said, well, what do you mean? I said, I, I'm, I have to acknowledge as a person who's grown up in my background, my environment, I have to be aware that I have certain racial stereotypes, cultural predispositions, things that I have to be aware of. I know mm -hmm. that as a human being living on this planet with a lot of different cultures and a lot of different ethnicities and a lot of different ways that people do things, that I'm going to have stereotypes and prejudices. And to say that I'm not a racist, I know what people mean when they say that. And I think with what they mean, I would not be classified a racist. Someone who lives in an international surrounding, I can count among my closest friends, a lot of diversity in my own family. I have a daughter who is not of the same ethnic race as myself. I've got a lot of things I could point to to say I am not a racist. And yet, if I want to actually help this world along, I've got to stand with every other person and acknowledge I have my own little internal battles and mental gymnastics I have to do. And the only way I can overcome them is to, I mean, the first step to, to, to freedom is admitting you have a problem. Absolutely. And so um, I liked that they went to this area at the end of the film. I might not have liked that Gregory Peck ended up with Dorothy McGuire, but I liked that Dorothy McGuire had the internal battles when she sits down with John Garfield and uh, who plays David, I believe it's David. That's right. Dave Goldman. Um, yeah. David Goldman. Um, I thought that sequence, that dialogue was really enlightening. Yeah. Well, very well put. And I, I concur completely. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. we, we, we all have these, these uh, prejudices baked sure. into us from, yeah. from day one kind of thing uh, is an awareness is, is key to, uh, to, yeah. to bettering ourselves and making it uh, a more pleasant experience for everybody else as well. Uh, not to go too off tangent, but I do want to just raise the uh, John Garfield 
I'm a huge Saturday Night Live fan. I've been watching it for years. And for many years, Alec Baldwin, who's one of the quintessential guest hosts, mm -hmm. he'll always do, um, he hasn't done it lately because Tony Bennett's died, but for, for a lot of years in the over the last 20 years, he would portray Tony Bennett. And, and there's still this one skit where Alec Baldwin being Tony Bennett is discussing films with Seth Meyers when Seth Meyers was still on the show. And and Seth's trying to get him to talk about a movie, like a recent movie, but being Tony Bennett, he mm -hmm. can't help but live in the past. And he just, Seth, you know what we need more, Seth? We need more movies with John Garfield. So who is your favorite actor these days? That Ryan Gosling show is the toast of the town. <laughs> But you know who I'd love to see on the silver screen again? John Garfield. He left us too soon when he croaked on top of a chick for hire. <laughs> he was a great, great Jewish leading man. <laughs> I used to call him my Hebrew. <laughs> <laughs> and so when I saw oh, John great. Garfield playing this quintessential Jewish character in the film, suddenly I just saw Alec Baldwin being Tony Bennett going, there's my Hebrew. <laughs> I know it's silly, but the thought. No, no, my it's mind. awesome. It's awesome. Speaking of people in the cast, though, li and little little Tommy, son of Gregory Peck's son, little Tommy is yes. played by Dean Stockwell. Of, yes, of yeah. David Lynch yes. movies and Quantum yeah. Leap and all right. the rest of it. You know, I saw he was in the. I saw his name in the opening credits, and I was like, that can't be that Dean Stockwell. Sure, was he? Yeah. He was probably only just being born around that time. But I had a look. And lo and behold, it was Dean Stockwell, who was, uh, yeah, about 11 years old at the time. And I was like, oh, he's little yeah. Tommy. Yeah. And sadly, yeah, only passed away uh, just a couple of years ago. during Yeah, the, yeah just really during the recently because yeah. uh, he was in the, uh, the reimagined uh, Battlestar Galactica. He played a, a key character right at the end. I will take so, your word for that because yeah. I did not watch it. But I did watch Quantum uh, Leap quite religiously yeah. back in the day. Okay. And okay. as Al, the hologram. That was yeah. the first thing I knew him from. And then I saw him later in lots of uh, David Lynch movies. Okay. Like Dune. And yeah, like Dune. One. Like Dune. Yeah. Don't get me on Dune again. I've been having to defend my uh, <laughs> my review with a couple people lately. And, and so you should. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> James, what about uh, Gentleman's Agreement at the Academy Awards? What uh, what were we, What number are we at Okay, okay, yes. So it was at the twentieth. The twentieth. The twentieth. The twentieth in nineteen forty-eight. It would have been, and it did uh, rather well. It won three Oscars. It won Best Motion Picture, Best Director, and uh, Best Supporting Actress, as we mentioned for Celeste Home. Uh, it, uh, Gregory Peck and Dorothy McGuire were both nominated, as was Anne Revere, who played his mother, yes, in the supporting actress character category. So that's interesting because often when you get two performers nominated in the same category mm -hmm. they they split, split the, the vote split and the neither vote, of them yeah. win but celeste home came out and uh, did remarkably well there uh screenplay and editing it was nominated for as well so yeah so not a bad not a bad run but um what was it up against i hear you ask so it was up against the other movie that we talked about talked about crossfire mm -hmm. which was you know the other movie on a similar topic that came out the same year you know which again that does happen and there's always yeah. like you know, one that completely overshadows the other. Uh, David Lean's Great Expectations. That's a classic mm -hmm. uh, Dickens adaptation. That's one of yes. one of the greats. Uh, that was in there as well, as was Miracle on 34th Street, which I know you're a big fan of. Big fan of, yes. Uh, also, the other one was um, The Bishop's Wife, which I am mm -hmm. not familiar with. I hadn't seen it, but that was remade into The Preacher's Wife with Whitney Houston uh, many years later. Right, 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 yeah. right. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's um, it's Cary Grant and Loretta and David Niven. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the only uh, the only film out of that uh, group of nominations that I've seen multiple times was Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street. I hadn't seen any of the others, as I mentioned, or Gentleman's Agreement. Okay, interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've seen Great Expectations. Uh, you know, that mm -hmm. is considered by many to be like the definitive adaptation of that with John Mills. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, in that, um, and Gene Simmons, who we'll be talking mm -hmm. about um, again. But uh, but yeah, no, it's it's it it did well. You know, I think what it's interesting that Daryl Zanuck was one of the people who um, really pushed to get it made. He was the producer mm -hmm. because I, if I remember it correctly, 
he's not Jewish, but a lot of people used to always think that he was Jewish okay. in Hollywood. If I've got that right. And so he was a bit pissed off <laughs> that he got, <laughs> he, ke- he kept be- re- being on the receiving end of anti-Semitism, And he was like, right, this needs to be made. Cause this is a real problem. You know, yeah. it's a problem for me and I'm not even Jewish. I believe that yeah. was, that was how that, um, that played out. And so he, uh, green lit the project and then won the oscar for it so well played yeah there. and then yeah alaya kazan uh it stirred up some trouble with the house of un-american activities oh, yes. commission yeah. after yeah. the fact which, which the way is... america's heading i think we're going to have another commission like that soon but it's uh, going to be terrifying yeah it's, it's going to happen scary again. it's uh, you, you think we would learn but apparently not right and, and of course alaya kazan was quite prominently involved in all of that because he named names didn't he yes I think. yeah he and he got blacklisted for a long time yeah i think a number of people involved did get blacklisted i think the screenwriter did as well um just purely for being involved even though they didn't say anything but i mean because i i first became aware of it there was many years later it must have been in the in the 90s when Elia Kazan was given like um, an honorary Oscar or a, yes, you know, I remember that I the remember Irving that. Herschel award or one of those, something yeah, like yeah. that. And quite a significant number of the uh, members of the audience didn't stand up to give him a, a, a yeah. standing evasion. Uh, even all those years later, they were uh, protesting against yeah. what he did during the uh, McCarthy witch hunts, as they were called. Yeah. Name names, it's going to uh, it's going to come back to haunt you. Yeah, sad but true. Okay, so yeah. where do you think? How do you think this stands up? Does it stand the test of time? You know, how do you think it stands up against other uh, other Oscar yeah. winners of that era? Yeah, I can't really speak to uh, other than Miracle on Thirty Fourth Street whether it deserved it that year or not. I will say that um, this is on the lower end of the films that stand the test of time. I think the theme is very relevant for today. Mm -hmm. Um, But as we said earlier, it's not a great movie. It's a good movie. And it probably won Best Picture more for its theme than for its actual technical prowess and and acting. Uh, Although, as we we mentioned, that that actually the acting was was probably what carried it through some other uh, negatives they had going for it. So I would struggle to say that this holds up whether it stands the test of time i don't mm-hmm. think this this film um has really carried like the very fact that i knew nothing about it uh kind of s- speaks volumes that it really doesn't it didn't inhabit the cultural zeitgeist for years later and uh although i found it a pleasantly um enjoyable film to watch once it decided to get going Mm-hmm. Uh, my my verdict would be that I think now of the films we're looking at in every best picture, I, I'd probably plop this one down in the one that does not stand the test of time. Yeah, I think I think I'm on the same page as you. I mean, I think the the upsetting thing is that um, the subject matter certainly does, and it's still just as important an issue to be raised yeah. and addressed and debated. You know, here we are. What's eighty years later? Something my maths isn't great. Yeah, about eighty years later, uh, and nothing has changed really. And yeah, anti-Semitism anything... has really reared its head again. And yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, so it's an important. Like I'm just going to echo what you said. It's an important message. It's not a particularly great film. Similarly, I think the fact that I hadn't seen it speaks as much about its its place in cinema history as the fact that I yeah. just can't get to everything uh despite the fact it's gregory peck alike as an etc etc um yeah again it's it's good yeah. not great and uh, glad glad i've seen it but mm-hmm. won't be rushing back well that's james and i's thought on the 1948 best picture gentleman's agreement what say you we'd love to hear your comments in the comment box below is this these themes are obviously in our opinion still relevant uh we're reading about anti-semitism around the world today Love to hear your thoughts, maybe how this film uh, relates to that. James? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, anything really involved with this that you feel is uh, is worth discussing. Uh, let's talk about the movie, though, you know, rather than yeah. getting into a whole big thing about, you know, just history in general. Uh, let's yeah. try and stay on topic, try and st- talk about the movie, and we'd love to hear from you. Until next time. Next time. Bye-bye. You are to be in.